Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, everybody who is present here, I am very glad to be here too because it wasn't so clear two days ago the German government declared a travel warning to Prague and other places. Uh, so uh, it was on my, well, it's on my own risk that I'm here. But uh, for urgent matters, it was allowed to travel to these uh, places where a warning was announced. And I think it is very urgent to speak about the relationship between the COVID pandemic and democracy. Actually, uh, when I was looking at the figures in Prague, you have no casualties so far, to my knowledge, so it shouldn't be so dangerous for all of us. Yes, uh, so my topic uh, is linked to what has happened over the last couple of months all over the world. So it's a global, a real pandemic. And after each crisis, and I may move on, that is a picture in the intensive stations where quite a few people struggled for their life. And as we know, although about 50, 60, 70 percent of the patients in the intensive care stations survive, but they have follow-up consequences because this virus is really not only hurting the lung, there are many viruses before, but the nervous system. And so, although those people who quit these intensive care stations uh, had very serious uh, health problems following. So, the, it's not just, if you look into statistics, the casualties, but also all those who seem to have recovered so to understand the seriousness of uh, the situation. So um, I start with asking myself, uh, after each crisis, we ask ourselves, can we learn out of history? Uh, we'll ask this question again after the major effects of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic will be over. So let us have a first look back into history of pandemics. And every human being has about two kilograms of bacteria in his body. We live in a kind of symbiosis which and should, could not, and we could not survive without them. So we have a kind of relationship with elements in the nature which can be very harmful, uh, but also supporting, so they're ambivalent in their character. And uh, there is a hypothesis that COVID-19 has been transmitted from bats via pangolins by consumption to humans. Humans always uh, ate wild animals. Actually, we started as hunters and gatherers and uh, so apparently we adapted to these risks over the several hundred thousand of years when human species started to evolve. And uh, as then the transmittance hypothesis was discussed, uh, there was a proposal to kill all bats in the world to prevent any pandemic coming via these animals uh, again on human beings. But there are about 6,000 species of bats, and they serve their agriculture by pollinizing plants. And uh, about 100 years ago, the famous German bacteriologist Robert Koch already proposed to destroy all wild animals to reduce bacteriological infections. So, Apparently, it didn't happen, and probably will never happen. So this is uh, the challenge we are looking at and rediscussing 
the issue of eradication of viruses at all. A crazy idea. Actually, diseases and virus accompany humanity since its very beginning. Out of several million viruses, only about 5,000 are known in detail today. They exist much longer than humanity since life on Earth began. That is about 700 million of years ago. Viruses will therefore never be eradicated. We have to adapt ourselves with or without vaccination. So we have to find a modus vivendi with them, but under which conditions? The German philosopher, already mentioned in the podcast before, Jürgen Habermas, declared recently there has never been so much knowledge about ignorance. And that is a challenge for philosophy, not only, but for all of us. Uh, since 2,000, 30,000 people died every year in ancient Rome by diseases, although at that time Rome has, or was regarded with its toilets and the more, most hygienic place on earth. However, no specific action was taken by the rulers, as the dead were quickly replaced by new immigrants. And the bubonic plague uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries diminished the European population by one third. Uh, it was the worst pandemic uh, in human history so far. Europe needed several centuries to overcome the consequences. Nevertheless, there are two positive developments which are, were the result of the catastrophe. So that is the first measure taken by the doctors then. A mask looks not as nice as ours or more interesting. Uh, so the outcome of the bubonic plague was new religious movements emerged which eventually led to Protestantism. You have in your walls Jan Hus, one of the prominent uh, figures in the time uh, that led to another schism within Christianity which strengthens the individual and the creation of modern medicine based on Arabic knowledge which contributed to enlightenment and the prolongation of life expectancy. For sure, the plague was not alone responsible for this evolution. There were other elements as well, too long to explain here. The Europeans introduced infectious diseases to Latin America after its conquest uh, at the end of the 15th century, which decimated the indigenous people uh, by more than 90%. Those diseases were the most deadly arms, although not deliberately used. The indigenous population in Latin America never recovered from this collateral damage. No lesson was ever learned except perhaps biological warfare. Europe was regularly infected by cholera epidemics until the 1980s. One of the major contributions to fighting cholera was made by the physician and pioneer medical scientist Snow, who in 1854 found a link between modern hygiene state and started, and nevertheless, cholera effects still an estimated three to five million people worldwide every year and causes 28,000 to 130,000 deaths. The most dreadful pandemic in modern times, that is the so-called Spanish flu, although it started in the United States uh, in 1918, had some 50 million dead, or others calculate even up to 100 million, 
out of a world population of less than 2 billion. This mortality rate put into relationship with today's world population would mean some 200 million casualties. Eventually, fascism and Stalinism emerged hereafter, leading to World War II with some 60 million casualties. There's not a direct link, but I think these frightening experiences for millions of people, uh, we'll discuss it later, led to reflection about sense of life and reason life and easy answers proposed by radical movements uh, were already there about 100 years ago. But positively, also international organizations were created like the League of Nations Health Organization in 1919, and the, which is the predecessor of United Nations World Health Organization. So this is an image of the Spanish flu treatment in 1918, 1919. Our hospitals look now a little bit better. That's one of the reasons why we have less casualties. Uh, but with that realization of the International United Nations World Health Organization came Hebrews. In 1948, US Secretary of State George Marshall, famous Marshall Fund inventor, confidently declared that humanity was about to eradicate infectious diseases from the earth. There was a Delphi forecast that is experts were asked uh, in their relevant field in Japan in the 1990s, with the results that in 2020, all diseases will be eradicated thanks to modern science and medicine. A utopia, which unfortunately will never come true. Normal flu viruses kill every year between 250,000 and 695,000 people globally without making headlines. Coronaviruses accompany humanity since some 600 years and are responsible for about 15 to 20 percent mortality of lung infections in annually. The SARS, the first SARS-1 severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 and 2003, also in, emerged in China, but only with about 800 casualties worldwide. And then followed by the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2012, where predecessors of COVID-19 also called SARS-2. So far, no vaccination exists for both these SARS-1 and MERS uh, infections. Therefore, it's very doubtful in my eyes if ever one for COVID-19 will be found. And even if appropriate medications and vaccinations will be available, there's the risk that vested interest will appropriate them via patents and by that increase social inequality. So only the rich and the rich countries will first of all dispose of these elements. So this is the nice COVID virus. Uh, the picture we normally have looks nicer, but this is the real photo. Uh, South Korea and Taiwan have drawn consequences out of SARS and MERS pandemic and seem to have rather well overcome the COVID-19 crisis until now. Germany too reacted to these two pandemics and developed an emergency plan in case of coronavirus in 2013. Uh, so it was exactly proposing what happened then in 2019. And the logic was that if we don't do anything, the famous herd immunity uh, scenario, that means that 60, 70 percent of people should be infected. And due to this herd immunity, the virus cannot spread further. 
But the price in this scenario was five million casualties in Germany alone uh, with this kind of virus not combating him. Already the US CIA forecasted a virus catastrophe. Consider the 2008 report, Global Trends 2025, which was all but oracular. The emergence of a novel highly transmissible and virulent human respiratory illness for which there are no adequate countermeasures could initiate a global pandemic in 2008. The authors warned the threat they added would likely emerge in an area marked by high population density and close association between humans and animals, such as many areas of China and Southeast Asia, even within limits placed on international travel, travelers with mild symptoms or who were asymptomatic could carry the disease to other continents. Bill Gates forecasted already further virus pandemic as lessons learned from Ebola in 2015. In an interview, he reiterates his argument there's gonna be a pandemic every 20 years or so. Let's deal with this one first, though. And you followed perhaps the dif different demonstrations, especially in Germany, of so-called hygienic demonstration, people who declare there's no virus and uh, it's all fake news. And so Bill Gates and George Soros are select as culprits, and if they are uh, COVID, then it's them who started to become even richer, although Bill Gates gave all his money to a foundation. So this is the title of Global Trends 2025 from the CIA, and uh, it's interesting how quickly we forget uh, these kind of scenarios. Definitely the COVID-19 is much more dangerous than the other coronavirus so far. Although it is far from the casualties caused by pandemics as in the past, the plague in the 14th, 15th century. There are different strategies to cope with it and therefore different results. The Swedish strategy to produce a so-called herd immunity failed so far. The United Kingdom and USA tried the same at the beginning with the known results. They have in Europe the highest casualties, Britain and USA in the world. Nevertheless, there are definitely panic and overreactions. So for example, in India and South Africa, also India has a big increase now of uh, infections. Uh, where COVID-19 restrictions cause more collateral damage than the pandemic itself. If millions of people will die out of hunger, non-treatment of other diseases, or the catastrophe will question the functioning of government. And that's what's happening. The German computer activist Sascha Lobo characterizes this approach as panic reason. We must recognize that in many ways defending public health and defending democracy are the two fronts in the same battle. Certainly the containment is a severe incursion into freedom rights, however, as already 600 years ago with the plague, it is the only way to restrict the explosion of infections. Conspiracy theories as always in times of crisis, spread more than ever before. This is not different today, but the so-called social media, the damage is more severe. You may have uh, heard or seen, we had in Berlin about uh, a week ago, uh, a de mass demonstration of these conspiracy theories, some 38,000, 40,000, it's not so much. But also in the US, there are demonstrations, but there are millions who go to the street and ne negate the effect of COVID. And uh, 
some crazy reactions because one of the conspiracy theories is the G5 telecommunication system, mostly developed by Huawei from China, is the reason for the COVID-19. So many G5 installations are destroyed and burned down, especially in Britain and in other places. So about one quarter of US citizens and French and oh, believe that the COVID-19 was deliberately or incidentally produced in Chinese labs. Probably the same people who believe that the Earth is flat and the universe was created only 6,000 years ago as written in the Bible and not 14.8 billion years as science confirms. For sure, there's behind the imagination of scientists like Frankenstein using science to dominate the world. But it's very rare that the president of the most powerful nation is spreading conspiration theories himself, but also Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte in the Philippines do the same. Not long ago, weapons of mass destruction, that is ABC, chemical, biological chemical uh, weapons, including warfare, were allowed. Actually, the Germans invented them during the First World War. But probably the most serious pandemic today is the casino capitalism, that is an unrestricted market economy. It is killing millions of people through famine, lack of drinking water, hygiene, medical care, and so on. The global financial crisis of 1929 brought forward many authoritarian and fascist regions. After the financial crisis of 2008-9, banks were saved with hundreds of billions of US dollars of public money. The responsible people were never prosecuted, and business as usual continued, including exorbitant bonuses. As collateral damage, populism and no fascism spread worldwide, again, like in the period between the two world wars. Today, illiberal or directed democracies take the occasion of a vile truth turn to increase their rule. But cope democratic regimes better than with COVID-19 than authoritarian regimes? It is very doubtful if there will be more democracy in the world after the COVID-19 pandemic. Out of 167 ranked countries, only 22 are today full democracies. And it is not United States, Brazil, or Japan who are part of the full democracies, but they are called flawed democracies. And US President Donald Trump stops financing the WHO because he blames the organization to be too much China friendly. However, a few days before, Trump says the US and China are working closely together in fight against coronavirus. So most probably the COVID-19 crisis would not only exacerbate social inequalities, but also increase international tensions, not only within Europe, but namely between the leading world power. There is, by the way, a collateral benefit caused by COVID-19 restrictions, normal criminality has been reduced, although cyber criminality increased. And that was a nice picture of Trump and Xi Jinping uh, when they were a better situation. And you see how quickly this can change. The political scientist Danny Rodericks asked, will COVID-19 remake the world? Definitely, COVID-19 has led to a kind of a civilization crisis. The only question is if the world will change for better or worse. For sure that the post-corona world will be another uh, than before. Hopefully, 
Will it be, however, more capitalistic, entrepreneur-friendly, and innovative, said a Swiss uh, journalist. As if it is not already so, and it is one of the reasons for the ongoing crisis. But as we see, especially in the USA, in a pluralistic or even polarized society, there are quite different positions and value systems also in regard to COVID-19. On the one hand, after the first openings of malls, shopping goes on as before. And we are amusing ourselves to death, as the US American sociologist Neil Postman wrote already more than 30 years ago. However, it is an understandable uh, that after severe restrictions and confinement, many people having survived want to catch up with the pleasures lost and even the more live intensely that happened after every war in human history. There's also a debate, namely from the extreme right and left, that the restrictions are undermining their civil rights. However, the three principles, liberty, equality, fraternity of the French Revolution from 1789 have to be balanced. Complete liberty means anarchy. A complete equality means restriction of liberties. Fraternity, today called solidarity, is in strengthening and uh, both liberties and equality. Therefore, it's a fundamental uh, value uh, for a civilized society. Fortunately, in any crisis, there's not only egotism which is spreading, but solidarity as well. But will solidarity sustain after the crisis? At this occasion, also the ugly anti-vaccination movement reappears. They do not and will not understand this is not just a taking risk for one's own life, but harming those of others. It is the same issue as with speed and gun control. This movement is accompanied with a fundamental distrust against science and the others if it means to change habits and values. Here again, cognitive dissonance shows up. We only accept those scientific findings, for example, new technologies, which earn of, of, to fit our own interest. So this is a, a picture from the US in front of the Congress. To summarize, that societies and human beings changed fundamentally after a severe crisis was the exception and limited in time. In most cases, a conservative reactionary turn happened. Citizens were looking more than ever for security. However, one thing which has been learned so far from pandemics over the last several hundred years is the improvement of hygiene and medicine. But one issue will be at the forefront now, the commodification and with the exploitation in the health sector, let us better say industry. In the past, hospitals were run by religious, humanitarian and municipal institutions. Today, it is quite often that capitalist companies control the sector looking for profits. Health has become a commodity. It is not a public good anymore. The consequences are exploitation, bad working conditions, and low salaries. I don't know for the Czech Republic, but for sure for Germany. Therefore, many foreigners work in the health sector in the rich West. So if the health care system and the care for elderly will be improved in the long run is very difficult to foresee. Crises, nevertheless, have triggered conscientization, as the Brazilian philosopher Paulo Freire wrote, that's meaning that you are becoming aware of the issues at stake. It led many people, on the one hand, to religious irrational action, easy answers, but on the other hand, sometimes also to more and better science, not too bad after all. 
Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, the environment has been less polluted over the last couple of weeks. For example, less traffic, home office, video conferences, and so on. Nevertheless, Homo sapiens is its own politicon, a social being. We need social contacts, not only via so-called social media. Insofar, we have to find a new balance between pandemic control and environmental protection. How to overcome the collateral damages? How to better pre be better prepared? Which lessons can be learned? Who are the actors for social change for better? The Red Unions, Fridays for Future, the researchers? What we learn from history is ambivalent. After the global crisis of 73, 79, we found two contradictory movements. On the one hand, the resurgence of neoliberalism with the elections of Maggie Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and Helmut Kohl in Germany. And on the other hand, the creation of green parties. Today, we are confronted with populist, fundamentalist, anarchist, pseudo-fascist political movements and politicians, as well as fundamentalist religious movements. On the other side are Podemos, Syriza, Fridays for Future, and other citizen movements, by the way, those who brought down the communist and socialist regimes in 89. And uh, so uh, we have some hope. The French philosopher Edgar Morin names there for our species not Homo sapiens sapiens, but Homo sapiens demens. That means we have many emotions, as now our scientists have found out, and often, quite often in politics, emotions are more important. Uh, than rational reasoning or enlightenment. As, for example, Trump goes into election without a program. Also, extreme right movements who were successful in Germany, the AfD, when they started, they had no political program. They were just against, or in case of Trump, you have to be for somebody. No ever content as make America great again or things like that or in the German case, against immigration. So after all, the American author Mark Honigsbaum called our times the pandemic century, 100 years of panic, hysteria, and hubris. That is the pandemic age, another interesting book by Nathan Wolf. And already in 2011, Nathan Wolf wrote The Viral Storm, The Dawn of a New Pandemic Age, long before COVID-19 appeared. Uh, but the psychologist Steven Pinker discovered that humanity in its history over the last 10,000 years become less violent and called this the better angels of our nature. He demands enlightenment now, the case for reason and science humanism and progress. The late Austrian future researcher Robert Young was asked at his 75th birthday where he gets his energy to struggle for the improvement of life. He answered, you know, I'm a 80% pessimist and 20% optimist, but for these 20% I live and fight. Perhaps his philosophy is also true for democratic participation. Let us continue even more hard. Karl Marx proclaimed socialism or barbary, but as we should, we have learned after experience with really existing socialism, it is better to ask for humanism than barbary. Finally, as literature tells of more about the human species, than many social science studies, my recommendation to read during these times of confinement, these two books of the Nobel Prize winners of literature, Albert Camus, The Plague, and Jose Saramago, a Portuguese, Blindness, Stay Healthy and Enlightened. Thanks for your attention. Uh, 
v tomto momentu jenom zmíním, že máme ještě několik minut před první pauzou, tak bych rád ještě uvítal naše první dva řečníky sem ke stolečkům a vy budete mít prostor na několik otázek, pravděpodobně tři, tři, čtyři otázky, takže když tak se hlašte, máte-li otázku. Good morning, uh, my name is Adela Horákova and I'm a Czech lawyer. I will ask the question in English because I understand you both speak English. In both of your uh, contributions, which were amazing, thank you for them, you mentioned opportunity and at the same time a threat coming out of inequalities. Uh, you mentioned gender inequality, um, um, social background inequality. What are the specific steps we can make to use these existing inequalities um, and profit from eradicating them in the future while enhancing our democracies? Apart from being a lawyer, I also represent the Czech marriage equality campaign. So my personal interest is in a um, inequality based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Thank you. Yeah. The question is to both of you. <laughs> Feel free okay. to ask as you want. Okay, perhaps ladies first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting question. Well, um, I'm also representing the person who is talking about uh, equal opportunities. Therefore, for me, the solution, the best solution, is to initiate the discussion about the equal opportunities. Uh, if you would ask me whether COVID crisis I do perceive as a threat or opportunity, for me, it's an opportunity. For me, it's an opportunity to change the things and the opportunity to have a better society if we start to talk about the things which we have not been able to speak before. As, for example, the economist, because before COVID crisis, when the economist started to talk about the fact that maybe the growth shouldn't be the only thing we are taking into account because there is a climate, because there, are, there is a safety and things like this, uh, I think that COVID is really the opportunity to rethink uh, those theories and to come up with the things which are not so efficient because economics is about the efficiency. And from my point of view, um, equal opportunities is the way for me. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the role of uh, social movements uh, which uh, strengthens in my view uh, during every crisis, but we have uh, to adapt uh, to the specific risks which are uh, grown up just uh, um, as freedom rights are restricted sometimes. Uh, we have to understand that uh, this is a price we have to pay for in regard to gender equality, social inequality, uh, I think we need a really strong dialogue, and this symposium is part of it, uh, on the risks and opportunities, as you mentioned. And now, in the deep crisis we are right now, perhaps a second wave is coming up, uh, the risks are more pronounced and visible, but this is the role of civil society and civil movements and people like you uh, to address in the neighborhood, in the municipality, locally, to uh, speak out of, for opportunities. And I think uh, the chance we have is strengthening civil society during this period. Okay, so I've slightly overestimated the time, so we have space for one more question. So, uh, I don't know, the choosers, okay, the choosers have chosen, so. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question about education. Uh, everyone knows that education is important thing in every life of every, every person. And uh, we know that people who are today are educated in some system, and it is actually a, a consequence of some educational system, and way how they think and how they uh, do all of their things, yeah? They are, uh, they are provided by this educational system. And my question actually is, what, uh, what you're gonna do with uh, educational system? 
to stop, uh, I don't know how to translate uh, to, to English, is šprtání, je šprtání. In education, it have no sense actually. It uh, can't, uh, uh, can't uh, provide uh, a, a natural interest of the small person, of, of children. Uh, what what you're gonna do to make uh, people interested in what they do and to make uh, more professionals because professionals build this world, professionals make things what are really important in this world. So actually what you're gonna do with this, uh, with this thing? Thank you. Uh, just to quickly translate šprtání, uh, probably cramming or memorizing or road memory exercising. Mm. So uh, uh, yeah. learning things by road memory rather than uh, mm. by understanding. Uh, I guess the question was about the um, Czech education system. So, no, like general, okay, general. Well, um, the main problem is that we are not able uh, to really treat talents. We do, not, we do not have any strategy for searching for talents. Our education system is based on being average, and this is something we need to change. Uh, regarding the memorizing, yes, there is a critical lack of critical thinking in the education system and the education to critical thinking, and it should be based on, um, on the conservation, uh, conversation between a teacher and a student. Well, what to do? Um, it's partly about the system, but it's also about the teachers. The teacher, we, we have to be the inspiration for the students. Inspiration for the students, and then they will start critical thinking. So it's about us. Yeah, well, I've been all my life a teacher, more or less, and um, I'm believing in enlightenment. Science is all about enlightenment. But what uh, I learned by H21 Institute, this is also very much concerned with children and learning, teaching, how to adapt or acquire democratic participation models. And there's quite a lot of research going on now that you can bring already from kindergarten on children to become aware of risks and issues. And we have uh, uh, children parliaments in the meantime, even with United Nations. So the practice of democracy has to be taught from the very beginning. So not just, uh, as Paulo Freire said, putting knowledge into brain, but uh, democracy is based on participation. If we don't have a strong civil society, all education will fail. So making children, students aware of their responsibility as citizens, as future, future citizens, I think this is one of the main tasks in a democratic society for the education system. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, uh, once again, many thanks to our first two speakers. Hats off to the both of you. And now we will... Oh, that's all. Thank you.